Welcome back to another vBrown Bag Build Day video. Today we're continuing with the SimpliVity 380 deploy here at HPE in Houston. And joining me to dig a little in under the covers of the SimpliVity platform is Brian Knudsen. What do you do for uh, HPE, Brian? Yeah, so I'm a senior technical marketing manager for SimpliVity um, within the HPE family. Um, what that means is I spend a lot of time helping the product marketing team put together materials, um, making sure that everything that they develop is technically accurate, working with essays and product management and occasionally engineers to understand the product as well as I can. And of course that makes you the ideal person to explain to our audience yep. what it is that this magic inside the SimpliVity platform is. Yep, definitely. And that's, that's where we'll start digging into the, the main software component of, of the SimpliVity solution, which we call the Data Virtualization Platform. So, so this is a good time to bring up the slides. Yeah, yeah. so let's go ahead and jump into the slides here. And um, this first slide kind of lays out um, what we call our three main pillars of the, of the DVP. Um, so the first one is the data efficiency. Um, we guarantee results of data efficiency. Um, all data that comes in created by the virtual machines that are running on the hyperconverged platform are going to be deduped and compressed. That's always on, happens for all the data across the entire, the entire SimpliVity infrastructure. Um, and it gets maintained in that state through its entire life cycle. So as we create backups, as we move data between sites, it all remains deduped and compressed. We never have to inflate it in order to send it to another site, for example. And there's a whole heap of architecture underneath that is based on the expectation that all the, the data is deduped mm -hmm. at, at start. And yeah. there's, there's a whole lot of the nice features that are entirely reliant on that dedupe, which is why you can't turn it off. It's a fundamental exactly. basis for the entire product. Yep. Yep, we use deduplication not just for saving capacity, that's actually kind of a side effect from what it was originally designed to do, which is to maintain data as efficiently as possible. So um, we kind of live by the mantra of the best I.O. is the one you don't have to do. So if we... And which is a Gene Andel quote. Exactly, exactly. So a long-term uh, uh, computer scientist who did a lot of work around the, the storage layers in the early days. Um, so main, ma making sure that we don't ever create I.O. that we don't need to. So if we're creating a backup and we can use it, use metadata to do it instead of um, instead of doing reads so and writes. Bulk copies of data the way traditional backups have been exactly. done. Exactly. So we don't see that giant spike at 2 o'clock in the morning when backups kick off and everything backs up all at once. Um, and this all happens through what we call our OmniStack Accelerator Card. This is a PCIe device that we put into every single node that we offload that deduplication and compression effort to. So it, it helps to ensure that we can do all that in a regular performance manner. So we're not hurting performance by doing deduplication. Mm -hmm. um, it allows us to avoid having an extra hit on the core CPUs as well. So we're not stealing from customers' business applications. And that's really the under, underlying technology that really makes everything we do possible. So that takes us to the second item, which is the built-in resiliency, backup, and disaster recovery. And what that is, is as I talked about before, using that, that data efficiency to be able to do backups very, very quickly. Um, each backup is a full independent copy. We don't have any concepts of incrementals, differentials. There's no having to rebuild through multiple points in time to get to a certain point in time. It's, I want this point in time and it's there. Um, it's completely disaggregated from the original virtual machine or any other previous backups. So, Ransomware breaks out, some sort of corruption happens in that virtual machine, you throw that virtual machine away and restore the, the backup. And the backups are not accessible to the ransomware, it can't go out and encrypt like it could with some of the image-based backup tools that, that organizations are using. Yeah, it would have to, it'd have to infect the SimpliVity layer itself um, and then get into the data virtualization platform. And we'll, we'll see a little bit on how we kind of avoid the hypervisor even knowing what's going on in that regard. Um, and what that ha what happens then is we can do those backups really fast. So we guarantee 60 seconds or less for any virtual machine up to a terabyte in size, creating that local backup. And as, as we'll see later um, in, in the day, that's that's actually pretty easy for us to do. So Yeah, I can recall seeing demos where it's really it's the delay of vCenter being updated yes. uh, when we're doing clones. And we don't even update vCenter with, with a backup. Yeah. So yeah, that, that targets... Uh, Although that looks awesome, it's, it's actually a really easy one for SimpliVity to achieve. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, and we'll, not in this session, but in another session, that we'll, we'll dig in even deeper and talk about really cool. how that happens. Um, and, and what that offers customers is the ability to do um, 
recovery point objectives in much more frequent fashion than they could before. So in that spike of creating backups, we can completely avoid that and not have to worry about that. Um, makes DR very easy, um, gives customers the ability, we've had many customers be able to actually exceed business SLAs when it comes to disaster recovery. So that's a nice. huge benefit for the customers. Yeah. Um, and underlying all that is what we call a RAIN plus RAID architecture. So we do a, a redundant array of independent nodes, so across all of our nodes. Then each node we also do a RAID set, so we're protecting against loss of individual disks per node. And then should one node get lost, all the data is on another node. So this is the defense and depth approach to exactly. availability. Yeah, we sometimes call it belt and suspenders. Don't want those pants to fall down. So the last piece then becomes a global VM-centric management. And this is where we get into um, really enhancing the simplicity part of hyperconvergence um, and being able to take all these different functions that we've talked about and put them into a simple GUI. Um, eliminating some of the management that normally you would have to do, like around storage, for example. Very, very simply create a data store, um, and that's it. You're, you're kind of done managing storage at that point. Then you simply create policies that are based around the virtual machines and when you want them to be backed up, how long you want them to be retained. Um, so all that overhead of management, making everything within this vSphere GUI um, in, a, in a VMware environment or the SEVMM environment with Hyper-V, and see a virtual machine, you right click on it, and tell it what you want to do. I want to back it up, I want to clone it, whatever that might be. And that's all policy driven rather than per VM set schedules Correct. and sets apply a policy across groups of VMs. Exactly, yep. So we, we simply create that policy, uh, we, we apply it to data stores so that VMs have default policies that they will pick up based on simply being on a data store. You can go in and change individual virtual machines if, if one day corporate decides, hey, we want everything backed up every 12 hours instead of every 24 hours go in, update that one policy, everything's updated. It takes you a minute at most. Right. But that policy is applied to a data store, but then you can override for individual VMs, so I don't have to have a, a data, sto data store per policy. Correct, correct, yep. Each virtual machine can have its own policy if you wanted to create every policy. Um, generally, customers are creating you know, the gold, silver, bronze type approach, usually is pretty sufficient for most customers. Nice. Cool. So let's uh, let's dig in a little bit. Um, we like to use graphics because you know it's easier to tell a story with a picture. So um, here, what we have is what we we call a cluster. So multiple SimpliVity nodes together um, in a single cluster, and that is based around the vSphere construct of cluster or the Hyper-V construct of a cluster. Simply by adding them in there, the nodes find each other and they say, "Hey, we're going to build a SimpliVity cluster together." So they integrate into the hypervisor management to discover that. That exactly. cluster layer and then yep. mirror it inside the software defined storage component. Yep. Yep. The only other way to do it would be through a CLI um, command because we don't have any other GUI. It's all it's all through the hypervisor management. So what you see here is the, the data virtualization platform living between the hypervisor and the actual hardware. Within that DVP, we've got uh, kind of three different layers. We've got the presentation layer, which is the interface that the hypervisor uses. So this is where the data stores live. This is where the VMDKs live. And all of that, all the stuff in there is, is just made up. It's virtual. This is where the virtualization aspect of DVP comes in, where we're able to, um, you know, we can create whatever data source. We can create them any size. We can resize them on demand, up or down, uh, without having to jump through really any hoops on our end. Um, the, the VMDKs themselves are really just um, constructs, presentations of the underlying data management layer which is where we have a file system and an object store. So within that file system is, is what we call data containers. This is essentially the, the combination of all the data that defines a virtual machine. And then below that in the object store is where we actually store the data. And as you can see from the, from the pretty lucky charms in there that um, you know, every one of those blocks is unique. There's no duplication between there. So that's, that's where the object store is the place where all of the unique objects are obviously enough stored. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And all this is um, complete SimpliVity IP. There's no taking ext3 and then modifying it and tweaking it and shoving an object store inside of it. Completely from the ground up written by SimpliVity, specifically for, as you said, deduplication in mind and the fact that this data is virtual and will be presented out 
whatever way we need to, to whatever hypervisor we happen to be talking to. And when we're talking about object stores, a lot of people working in enterprise IT will be used to them as being a low performance, um, eventually consistent. There's a whole heap of characteristics that are driven by the S3 AWS mm -hmm. type object store. This is not that nope. kind of object store. Nope, nope. We are an enterprise technology. We were designed for core data center workloads. So when things go in the object store, they're there, they're solid, they're immutable. So no one can go in and say, oh, I need to change that particular block. If, if a VM comes in and wants to change a block, that's a new object in the object store at that point. Um, and we'll get into that in that deeper dive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when we want to create a clone of a virtual machine, we can take that, that VM1, that data container there, and when a clone happens, we copy that data container and we represent it up. And now it's a new virtual machine. At that point, we'll, we'll integrate into the vCenter and we'll say, hey, you've got a new virtual machine, a new VMDK that's been presented. So how big is this thing that we've just cloned to clone a virtual machine? Um, that's that's probably on the order of K kilobytes. Right. Um, so very, very little data action that needs to happen, even if it's a one terabyte virtual machine. And does not make any difference if it is a big virtual machine, nope. how much we copy? Nope, because it's, again, when we get into the deep dive, it, it makes it a little bit more obvious about how we're doing that. but. So essentially, we're, we're copying a piece of metadata that then references that same set of data because it's 100% duplicate. So there's no I.O. on the object store and the actual blocks that need to occur. Kind of by definition, when I say clone something, I'm not going to create anything more that's unique. Or yes. I certainly shouldn't. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's really the concept. And, and the advantage to customers is, um, from an operations perspective, I want to create a clone. I want it done right now. The sooner it gets done, the faster I can move on to the next thing. So similar thing happens if I look at um, VM3 there and I want to be able to take a, a backup of that virtual machine, I can simply copy that data container, mark it as a backup instead of a virtual machine, and notice it doesn't get presented up. So it's staying completely within the data management layer. And since it's not going through the presentation layer, the hypervisor has no idea what's going on there. And this is where we get that level of protection where unless they can dig in and actually access and, and, and um, corrupt the data management layer, the DVP itself, there's no knowledge of that from, from a malware perspective. Right. And um, the, the clone and the backup looked quite similar. Yes. Yeah. It, at this level, pretty much the same set of code. Okay. Um, so again, it's, it's a metadata copy. Nothing changes in the object store um, from, from the actual data perspective and happens in, in a matter of seconds. That's, this is where we get to that 60 seconds or less aspect of things. So again, more or less the same operation when I'm restoring that virtual machine, I make a copy of that data container. That copy of that data container really is just, here's a new metadata that's exactly the same as this last one. I'm gonna present it, register it, allow the user to power it on. Once it powers on, then things start to shift because that, you know, each operating system boot is a little bit unique and it's going to write some data and it's going to... It's going to write some logs to say I've started yep. up, if, if exactly. nothing else. Exactly, and that timestamp alone is going to make it unique. So now the data shifted a little bit underneath. It's no longer, you know, VM4 is no longer the same metadata that that backup was, and that backup was the same metadata as VM2. Of course, VM2 drifted at one point, so now they're, they're all unique data containers um, as soon as data starts to change. So now if we zoom out a level, we have this concept of what we call the federation. And we have that data virtualization platform extend across multiple clusters now. And this is where we get that ability to do remote backups and maintain that deduplication and compression because they're all talking a common language. So here we've got the DVP going across three different sites. We've got the presentation and data management layer in each one. And of course we've got that, that um, uh, file system where we've got the the metadata level. Um, think of think of these as these data containers as simply instruction sets on how to put together all the different blocks. So we show that in a little bit more detail, and of course we have the object store underneath. Very simple example: we can see a lot of duplicate data in an individual virtual machine. But if I want to create a backup of this virtual machine from that Boston to Tokyo data center, I simply share that metadata table. Now at that point, the Japan or the Tokyo data center has the ability to say, okay, well, what don't I already have? At this point, it's, we're, we're not having a conversation about what have I already sent you or what has changed, but the receiving side actually defining, I don't know these pieces. I've never seen these blocks of data. This metadata is new to me. Can you send over the actual data? So at that point, the Boston Data Center is going to say, okay, here you go. Here are those two blocks that you were missing, and now I can fully reconstruct that backup, that virtual machine that I moved over. And this is where 
you know, we've had customers do DR, have multiple sites who never would have been able to do it before. And it's particularly up in Boston to, to Tokyo, there's going to be some slow links, high latency. Yep. This is going to be a challenging place to move any data. Yep. And, and bulk backups will, would be very problematic across yeah. that. Yeah, even, even if it's a satellite connection between the two, right. we've, we've had some good success stories around that. So now if I zoom out even further and show you know, a very complex, a very global environment, I can see I've got a lot of different sites. You know, those, those two node sites are probably remote offices. Um, that really big site there in India is, you know, maybe it's DR for every site. Every site's gonna back up there. Or maybe it's just the, the APAC region is gonna back up there. I've got all these different pieces. So from a management perspective, I could do one vCenter across all of them. Um, and that's perfectly legit from a SimpliVity design perspective. It may not be the best practice to do it from a, from a management aspect, so maybe you divide that up by regional. Or maybe you do a vCenter per site. Um, we support all the configurations, and you know it's kind of whatever works best for the customer. And understanding vCenter's role in the vSphere environments is about the same as its role is within the SimpliVity environment. It's there for a management interface. Um, if it's down, everything continues to operate. You just are a little crippled on how can't to do, do things. The, the administrator can't, uh, can't do their job, but the actual staff yep. using the system can continue. Yep, exactly. Above that, we have a series of different um, uh, automation platforms, cloud platforms, whatever, whatever you will for higher level management mm -hmm. um, that we've supported over the years. And now, you know, with, with being part of HPE, having one view coming soon. Um, as, as a management platform as well. All that's automated by REST APIs. Um, so we have okay. REST APIs that allow all of these things to happen and allow higher level management tools to be able to access our underlying technology to be able to do clones and backups without having to um, give an end user access directly to the vSphere client. And that's for integration into whatever it is that you Absolutely. use automation with for, for the processes. Yeah. Ticket nice. automation, DR automation, any of those types of things can access our REST API for with, without any problems. Great, Brian. Well, thank you very much. Yep. That's, uh, good to have a look at the data virtualization p platform. As Brian said, we will have a, a much deeper look inside the, the DVP in a coming video. And stay tuned for all of the remaining videos of this uh, SimpliVity 380 build day with HPE. Thanks, Al.